Yeah, I'd be happy to. GSTC was created in the year 2007, and the uh, founding organizations were UN agencies and global leaders in conservation, uh, WWF, Rainforest Alliance, and the two UN agencies, UNWTO and UN Environment, at that time UN, UNEP. And uh, we were created um, initially to create baseline standards for sustainability in travel and tourism. And, um, and then to apply them in a variety of ways as training tools, raising awareness of what sustainability means, because sustainability is so complex and so broad that um, it was felt that we need a set of standards to kind of lay out what is sustainability <laughs> in travel and tourism. Um, and so um, we were created and, and, and issued first in 2008 uh, standards, sustainable standards for hotels and tour operators, sort of two key building blocks of tourism, two types of businesses. And then later we added destination criteria, which are guidelines for policy makers and destination managers. And a key piece of, uh, of our work is that um, it's based on four pillars, the, the two sets of criteria that sustainability includes not only environmental issues, but also social issues and cultural and uh, management issues. So those are the, that's the basis of our work is the GSTC criteria. Well, um, to answer that question, I kind of think of the private sector and the public sector, and we work in both realms. Um, in the public sector, in both cases, I would say the success stories are kind of in isolated places. I, I cannot point to a very broad area or a broad set of activities that are highly sustainable, unfortunately. Um, um, on the, <clears throat> in terms of destinations, um, destination management, there are many case studies that tend to be kind of smaller units. I wouldn't point to any one country and said that they've really done well. <laughs> Some are doing better than others. Uh, and many elements of sustainability are not just about how are you managing tourism, but it's how do you manage sustainability in general for your residents. For example, here in Korea, you do amazing amounts of recycling and, and you have good public utilities for waste management. In the developing world, waste management is a critical problem in tourism because it's a critical problem for the life of the residents. Uh, so, and you cannot separate you know, the life of the residents from the life of the visitors. So, uh, because so many, kind, so many of the issues that we look at from a public policy standpoint relate to both water management, sewage treatment, um, Single-use plastics, we shouldn't have these. We do so many things right in Korea, but uh, we shouldn't be having single-use plastics. Um, so it, it's completely uneven. And you know, so one place or one business might do a few things very well, but they're not doing everything well. And this is the problem. So we can't point to a, a place or a set of businesses that are doing exceptional because I would argue that Nobody's really hitting the mark on all the elements of sustainability, and we really need to take a more holistic view of it. Well, that really comes down to local management of the tourist experience. Um, and we've seen a tremendous uh, growth in this, what is often referred to as over-tourism. Um, and there's two things that are happening. One is that over-tourism and sort of crowding of some iconic cities and cultural heritage sites in the world have become much more dramatic in recent years. Uh, key factors there are the growth of the Chinese outbound market, but the general growth of middle classes in Asia in general, and, and in the world in general, but led by Asia and led by China. So there's more people traveling. 
Then we have technological advances. Um, everyone's a travel agent now with our smartphone. And the sharing economy brings things like Airbnb and so forth, where there's a lot more capacity of accommodations. Uh, so a variety of factors have come together. And then discount air carriers have grown to allow more people to travel. Um, so we have this surge in demand of travel in recent years, whether it's international arrivals or it's domestic travel within a country as well. All of that has grown pretty dramatically. So we do have some critical issues. The problem is not new. Um, I mean, in the early 90s, when I was working in the private sector as a tour operator, 25 plus years ago, we would try to figure out how do we give our client a good experience in Venice because it's so crowded. So this has been going on for a long time. What's changed is that it's reached such a critical point that we've, we've started seeing some citizens' protest movements. And we've finally seen mainstream media pick up on this story that those of us in the travel industry have been dealing with for a very long time. I mean, I was on the board of the European Tour Operators Association in the 1990s when we were dealing with the Alhambra in Spain, this fabulous World Heritage Site that they instigated a visitor management control system where you have to have advanced reservations to visit the palace. And the system has been operating beautifully now for 20 years. But it was sort of a surprise that they suddenly did that. But that was 20 years ago. Did anybody write then about over-tourism? No, it's just suddenly it came into the forefront and I would argue it's because of, it hit the mainstream media because of a few prominent protest movements. Now you look at a place like Barcelona, I think a key piece of all this, well, you know, the, 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 the essential piece here is that cities need to manage better because I would make a strong argument that society doesn't understand how complex travel and tourism is. And so therefore government doesn't either. And government around the world, I'm not gonna pick out any one place, but we see this as a major trend all over the world. Government just rotates people out of the ministries of tourism on two year cycles like they do for a lot of jobs. I've been working in travel and tourism for 35 years and feel like I learn something new every day. If you think you can come in and manage tourism on a two year cycle, that's a tremendous mistake. And so we see this in governments around the world of just, it takes 18 months to learn anything and then you'd have no time to, to implement anything. So I think that's the most critical problem is that governments are not managing well and in many cases they're not managing at all. And so they have to, they have to develop internal expertise. Uh, we're working very closely with the Ministry of Tourism of Indonesia and there's a delightful band there who really understands sustainable tourism and he's been there for many, many years. Very unusual that each minister keeps him there <laughs> as political change and new people come in at the top. That is all too rare. So this is the most critical thing is governments need to step up and, and develop internal capacity to manage and then they need um, to move more quickly. I don't know if we're gonna talk about the sharing economy and the Airbnb effect, but so that's a critical thing is just managing better. Um, but then another point I wanna make is that um, citizens' attitudes, that psychology of tourists bothering me, you reach a tipping point. You know, in many cities around the world, there might be an annoyance where for a long time there have been so many tourists in one of my favorite places and they've sort of taken over. Well, I lived in New York for many years and I mean, Times Square went over to the tourists 30 years ago. And you know, if you lived in New York, you just said, okay, well, we don't go to Times Square anymore. <laughs> it's too crowded the visitors. But there are many other things that we could have in our city. <laughs> so we didn't complain loudly because we just avoided Times Square. Well, the people in Barcelona are annoyed because a district with some of their favorite coffee shops and bars and restaurants have been overtaken by visitors. So it's all about what's really happening and are you managing it? Are you figuring out how to disperse the visitor experience? Very little thought is given to that, but there are management techniques locked away in academia that cities don't know about because they don't even have people working in tourism long enough to learn the principles. So. Um, it's a complex issue, uh, and each solution is, is localized, uh, but you need, the, you need the internal capacity, you need the internal expertise to develop a long-term plan and then see it through.
Yeah, well, it's a difficult question. And um, I've gotten to know the Jeju situation a little bit because I've been coming here for several years at the um, UNITAR Training Center, Seafall Training Center, and um, I've had the good fortune to travel around your island quite a bit. I don't have a strong opinion on whether you should have another airport in the southeast because there are environmental concerns, there's quality of life concerns, so those should be considered. You need to balance that decision carefully. I absolutely applaud this. This is fabulous. I use this as a global case study of the EVs, the electric vehicles that you're moving to in Jeju. Um, so that's fabulous. And um, I visited Udo Island, which I think is a wonderful case study also, where the province kind of uses the smaller island as a test case. And the electric buses are going around the island and these little carts, two-person carts, brilliant. This is uh, world class. So that's something to be very proud of and very excited about. But I also know that those 2015 targets, the creation of the, 20, the targets in 2015 for 2030 are moving more slowly than everybody would like. So it shows, shows the difficulty, but it, um, it shows an opportunity. I think Jeju could um, be a leader and it could support, help the brand. Um, I think Jeju is a little bit of a brand identity issue as well because um, you know, I'm aware that it's the only place in the world that has the trifecta of three UNESCO designations, a World Heritage, Biosphere, and Geopark, which is a fabulous thing. But for the visitor who's coming here for that brand, an international visitor who wants to see volcano and hiking trails and so forth, you arrive in an airport that looks like an airport anywhere else, it's overcrowded, and you come into a city that looks like a city anywhere else, it's overcrowded, <laughs> and where's the green and where's nature? Um, so I think you need to do everything you possibly can to manage visitor flows. So moving more quickly into EV rental cars, um, you know, just softening the experience for the arrivals. Um, something's got to be done to make because your airport is indeed overcrowded. I've come at all times of day at different times of the year and it's a pretty, uh, pretty busy scene. So I don't know if a second airport is a solution or making the existing one somehow improved with better visitor flows. Um, and then, but you've got so many things going on. You've got the Korean tradition of honeymoons here. You've got, it's a major domestic destination. Um, so you really have to make decisions here as to who are we, who are the core target markets that we really want to attract and support. Uh, because you can't be all things to all travelers. Um, you know, so if you want to fight over crowding, then you have to think about, well, who are the, who are the visitors that are most important to us economically and psychologically? And let's develop for them. And don't try to develop for everybody. Um, are you, you know, going to just keep putting shops in for Chinese who like to buy luxury goods? Or are you going to develop for people who are here for nature or for Korean honeymooners or Korean 20-year-olds? or Who is it? Uh, and, and you can welcome everybody. But in terms of development, you have to set some priorities. <laughs>
um, somehow getting that word out that we have a variety of experiences. Um, and uh, you've done very well in MICE, Meetings, Incentive, Convention, and Exhibitions. The convention centers in Korea are world class. Uh, Korea and Australia every year go back and forth between one and two in terms of volume, of number of events, and number of visitors. So you've got tremendous success there in that business traveler for uh, trade shows and conventions and so forth. Uh, but you haven't really done a lot as a country on the leisure traveler. Um, and, you know, I think there's opportunity there um, because I think with your aging population and the countryside, you may have some small coastal towns that don't have a lot of economic activity. Um, there's a lot of charm there. And I think that the urban world, um, including your neighbors from Tokyo and Shanghai, you know, most of the world is urban now. And we, we're looking for quality experiences in the countryside and nature. And uh, so you have tremendous infrastructure. And I think there's an appeal there that, uh, that the world doesn't know that it could go find kind of a quiet, out-of-the-way place. I think that's an opportunity for Jeju and all of Korea. Well, it's a complex issue. Um, I, I don't know a great deal about the history of it, but I do know that you've had some successes and you've had some failures of cross-DMZ um, tourism. Um, I think there's tremendous potential for the North welcoming the South, the Southern visitors. They could get tremendous economic uh, development from that. So if they move beyond just the occasional family connection and just really open it up to the South Korean visitor, um, you know, that would, that would tr create tremendous uh, jobs. And, and, you know, something we don't think about so much, but international inbound tourism is an export economy, right? You think of export as Samsung makes a smartphone and sells it abroad, right? That's export economy. International inbound tourism is export economy because the international visitor comes with their currency and spends it in your country. So just think of all the South Korean won that would come in into North Korea, and that would be a big boon to their economy. So if they can get over issues of distrust and so forth, it would be a tremendous thing. I also think that along with what I just said about the world doesn't know how good, how interesting South Korea is, <laughs> um, you could do this, you could benefit in South Korean inbound tourism where international people could come and visit North and South in the same trip. It'd be a huge benefit to both and then that would really get, you'd have just free publicity <laughs> from around the world if, if packages were available for people to come from Japan and Europe and Australia and the Americas, you know, wherever, you know, any developed, or any international traveler uh, come here. Everybody would be curious to see North Korea. And they would, and they, if you built the packages, if they see both, um, both countries would benefit tremendously. So I, I think there's great opportunities. So, but it has to start with the South Koreans going north because they have, major capacity to build. You don't, as I said earlier, tourism is complex and people underrate that. You need the skill set to greet the people. You need the transport mechanisms. Um, you need some infrastructure and you need internal resources and you need hospitality skills. So I think it's best for them to start with Korean to Korean and then expand to international inbound. Well, the way it should change, in my view, is that we've got to figure out ways to um, disperse travelers. We have seven and a half billion people on the planet. Um, many capital cities are now overcrowded with visitors and annoying citizens in some of the cities you mentioned. And virtually every capital city, there's at least some neighborhood that somebody's annoyed <laughs> with too many visitors. So we've got that issue already. 
uh, world population has not finished growing. And it's going to continue. The projections are you know, much more international travel. So whatever problems we face today need immediate solutions. And a key piece of it is that we need to develop more destinations. We need to disperse the visitor. We have to disperse the visitor in two ways. We have to give them more places to go to, develop more places, and then promote them effectively, because visitors tend to want to just go to the iconic places, the places they've heard of, and the, all the discount air carriers go to the places they already know of, right? So you've got a, a capacity issue, you've got a promotional issue. Um, that's not easy, but it has to be addressed because we can't just keep sending people to the same cultural heritage sites in the same cities. So we have to, and then the other way to disperse is at the busy places, they have to disperse in terms of time of day and time of year, and we have to avoid crunch spots. I mean, you could argue that China Golden Week uh, is an unsustainable activity by having millions and millions of Chinese travelers travel all at the same week. Now that's a cultural and political issue, but it creates for an unsustainable <laughs> issue. Uh, Europeans have a tradition of all of August, you know, many people take the entire month of August off, so tourist infrastructure is absolutely overloaded in, everywhere in Europe, every August. Well, you know, maybe we shouldn't all travel in August if we're European, and maybe we shouldn't all travel in Golden Week if we're Chinese. We need dispersal, we have to. We can't just keep choking airports and bus terminals and hotels and all of our features and damage them with overcrowding. So we have, so it should disperse. And so that's the should. And then how will it, the, how will it will have to follow the should? Because we're reaching critical, critical points in many places where we simply have to change that and figure out ways to, um, to not have everybody go to the same place at the same time.